basically the same thing, this next bit. We're going to do a lot more practice, but it's now going to become very abstract and just using the formulae that we have here. So we're going to think about the full laws of probabilities. And actually, whilst I have that up on the board, I am going to quickly get a formula book and see which of these actually appear in the formula book. So let's just quickly go to the statistics section. That's for AS. We don't want that. So you do get this one at the bottom is in the formula book. Um, you get this one in the formula book, but it's written in a slightly different way. You get the probability of A and B equals that one times that one. So you get it written in a different way around. And you get a crazy one in the formula book that you just would never use, which I won't show you can look at it another time, but like it's just ridiculous. Thank you for that. It, I'll, I'll write it down really quick. Just to, It says the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given not A. Like, it's just silly. So you, you'll never use that other formula that you've got in the formula book. But lots of these are already there, OK? It's just there. And they've also told you shh, shh. these are also in the formula book, OK? The independence laws. A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. This one is new, though. We haven't really talked about this one. It's more, shh. Why is this? Um, why does this show independence? It's because if they're Fantastic. If they are independent, the probability of A is going to stay the same regardless of whether B has happened or not. If they're completely unrelated things, then they, those two things should be the same as each other. So if they ask you to do a test for independence and it's in a conditional probability question, if you can show that this is the same as this, you've also got that independence law. Okay? You can show if the two things are independent. You get confused about that one? if they're independent. So the reason why this works, if you think about the probability of A is flipping a coin and getting tails on the coin, and the probability of B is it's raining outside, the probability that you flip a coin and it's raining outside is going to be the same as just probability of flipping a coin. Because if it's raining outside, it's not going to affect me flipping a coin. They're completely independent events from each other. OK, yeah, Hamza. probability of A given B is zero if they're mutually exclusive. Um, but it doesn't necessarily show that they, does it show that they are mutually exclusive? Yeah, it does show they're mutually exclusive. Yeah. So here for the mutually exclusive ones, A and B cannot be equal to zero. And A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Well, if you just think of the Venn diagram and they're mutually one second, if you just think of these as being mutually exclusive, the A or B, it's just that one plus that one. Wait, well, what did I say? You said A and B cannot be zero. Oh, the probability of A and B is zero if they're mutually exclusive because they don't oh. overlap each other. Sorry. I said it too fast. I actually felt my, my voice getting faster and faster. Now, we've already seen this one here. They, they, like I said, the, the formula book gives you a different version of this. I want you to know this one. I don't want you to be looking through the formula book for this because it's so basic and needs to be used. This one we spoke about um, briefly before. The probability of A or B, the union of A and B, is A plus B minus A and B. And I've written in the box that goes with this. This is known as the addition law. And the informal proof is that if we added the probabilities of A and B together, then the sets in the Venn diagram would be double counting the intersection, like that overlapping bit in the middle. So that's why we subtract it once to kind of counteract that double counting that we've got there. So these formulae, I think they're pretty much all in the formula book. So it's great. If you do get in a panic, you've got all of those available to you. Some tips that I have here. So if I were to identify two tips that will possibly, possibly help you the most in probability questions, I would say if you see the words given that, immediately write out the law for the conditional probability. Don't do it at the end of the question. Do it straight away. So if you saw something and it says, given that Bob walks to school, find the probability that he's not late. So you would write down the probability 
that he is not late given that he walks to school and I would write down in here what would be the first bit? Uh, not, L not L and W over the probability of W. And then the complexity of that question, you've just smashed the complexity and replaced it with something that's just a simple division that you've got there. So write the formula down as soon as there's the worded part in the question. It makes everything become easy, OK? If you see the words are independent, immediately write out the laws for independence even before you've finished reading the question. So if A is independent from B, the first thing you would probably write down, well, what's one of the independence laws? Good, that's our first independence law that we should write down. What did we say the other one was from the previous page? The probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. Or you might write the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. If you get stuck on a question where you have to find a probability given others, it's probably because you failed to take into account that two events are independent or mutually exclusive or that you need to use the conditional probability or addition law. So there are, that's everything we need to know about probability. Okay, that's everything that there is for probability. Um, even the stuff we're going to do later on about tree diagrams is just the same ideas as what we've got here. But the most complex stuff that you will see on a year 13 paper will be a Venn diagram using the laws of probabilities kind of stuff. That's my, my take on how the, probability, how the stat stuff has looked. And as you know, I've looked through all the papers and analysed all the questions, so I have quite a good idea of like what are the, the common things that come up here. Okay, So let's just dive in and do um, an exam question here together. So first of all, it says, explain what you understand by a sample space and also an event. These are different things that you could possibly get ans asked here. Now, I wanted to make sure I had the correct writing for this. So by a sample space, what do we think a sample space actually means? The set of all outcomes. It's the set of all outcomes. Have you able to zoom in and just see what it says there, Hamza? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a sample space is the set of all outcomes, OK? And if you think about like when you drew a sample space, um, I don't know, in year nine and it was about flipping a coin and rolling a dice you would have like all the possible outcomes that you would have it would be like a grid so part a the answer is the set of all outcomes what we understand by an event an event is a set of one or more outcomes let's put it down here so i can make it bigger a set of one or more outcomes so it's a subset of the sample space it doesn't have to just be one of those things it could be a few of those things um, if you want to have an example with this, if we had flipping a coin, you either get heads or tails, and I don't know, spinning a spinner that's got four numbers on it, you can either get 1H, 1T, 2H, 3H, 4H, 2T, 3T, 4T. This thing here, this is the sample space because there's eight different outcomes that you can get. And an event might be getting an even number and a heads on the dice. So that could be an event. It doesn't have to just be one of those things. It could be a couple of those things there. OK, so that's just a, an example for that. OK, so we've got two events, A and B, are independent. Great. Independent means we should use one of our independent flaws immediately. So they want us to find out the probability of A and B. Well, we know that that's the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So that's a third times a quarter, which is a twelfth. Simple, hey? D wants us to find out the probability of A, given that it's B. Well, that's the probability of A and B, divided by the probability of A or B? B. Of B. Pardon? Ah, oh, they're independent. So the probability of A, given B, is just good. So I actually didn't take my own advice there, where for the independence laws, I should have written down that the probability of A given B is just equal to the probability of A. So it's just a third. But it works here, because you get a twelfth divided by a quarter, which is a third. So Mr. Bison's slow method, Hamza's quick method of remembering what he just has been taught on the previous page, which I didn't do. Well, I should hope so. 
So this is really the one we should have done. And then A or B, well, we know that A or B is probability of A plus the probability of B minus the A or B. So you've got a third plus a quarter minus a twelfth, which is a half. OK, so then you could construct a Venn diagram from all of that information that you've got there. But that's a pretty, a pretty straightforward question. So hopefully I've, I think my next one's a bit harder than this. Yeah, it's a bit more hard, a bit trickier. So you're just going to try and become more confident in using those laws so that you can apply them a few times, right? So I'm going to try, start doing the next one. You can do, do some of it yourself if you prefer. C and D are two events, so that C is this and D is this, and C given D is this. So first of all, I want to find out what is the probability of C and D. Any ideas of how I could find out what C and D is? Nope, I can't multiply C and D. Why am I not allowed to multiply the probability of C by the probability of D? They're not independent. They haven't told me that they're independent. And I can tell that they're, well, I, I can tell they're not independent. How can I tell they're not independent? This is not equal to this. So they're not independent from each other. They're definitely conditional events here. So how else could I find the probability of C? The given that formula, good. So I can use that the probability of C given D is the probability of C and D divided by the probability of D. So if I want to find out C and D, it's going to be the probability of C given D by the probability of D, which is the probability of C and D. So probability of C given D is 0 0.3, D is 0 0.6, so we get 0.18 is the probability of C and D. So we use the given that formula to find out this one here. So you might have felt like, I can't find that, but you've got to look at the information you've got and think, how could you sub it into that formula? Probability of D given C, well, that's easy, because we know the probability of D and C. Obviously, C and D and D and C are the same thing. And we divide that by the probability of D. So it becomes 0 0.18 divided by... You divide by the probability of C, sir. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn it. Making mistake after mistake. Divide it by the probability of 0 0.2. And 0 0.8 out of 0 0.2 is 0 0.9. And now we want to find out C union D, or C or D. What do I do for C or D? Good. The probability of C or D is the probability of C plus the probability of D minus the probability of C and D. 0.2 plus 0 0.6 minus 0 0.18. So you get 0.8 minus 0.18, which is 0.62, 0.62. So you've got three answers for this. Didn't need to draw a Venn diagram for this one, because given that, it's a little bit harder to represent on a Venn diagram. So you've got to think about using the formulae. I personally prefer the Venn diagram kind of questions, because the formulae all look a bit more, like this looks super confusing, unless you know what all these symbols mean. But they're all right. I'm going to do one more question, and then it's over to you pretty much for the, the rest of the lesson. We'll get lots of practice done. You okay? Mm -hmm. Go for it. While some of you are writing that down, I'm planning for teaching you the binomial stuff. Have you ever used these before in lessons? No, okay, because I'm going to be wanting you, I'm going to teach you how to use these with the calculator as well, because I actually think 
These are the um, binomial probability tables. So it's what's inside your calculator, but your calculator will only show you one of these numbers at a time, whereas I can show you the, ho the page allows you to see everything. It's a bit more powerful. So I'm going to get you to do both at the same time, OK? Anyway, so last one that I'm going to do, and then it's, it's all over to you for the rest of the lesson. State in words the relationship between the two events, R and S, when the probability of R and S equals 0. You've already said it. What was it? They are mutually exclusive. R and S are mutually exclusive. Quick little exam note here. If you're just in a complete mind blank and you don't remember the word mutually, sometimes people find that word harder to remember. If you just wrote exclusive, if you wrote these two events are exclusive, that would give you the mark. It just scrapes the mark, OK? But mutually exclu exclusive is the better phrase. But if you do just say exclusive, that's just enough if you can't quite remember what the word is in the exam. OK, so we've got the, pro um, the events A and B are independent with these kinds of facts that we've got here. OK, well, a reminder, if they're end independent, a and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. And we also know that A given B is equal to the probability of A, in case those things are going to be useful for us. What do you think we're going to do to try and find out what the probability of B is? We've been told what A or B is. So should we think about, if we've been told what A or B is, why don't we actually look at that formula as well, which is going to be the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And now we can start subbing some things into this formula. So A or B is 2 thirds. A is a quarter. B is the thing that we don't know. So you could call the probability of B x, or you could call it b. I don't care what you call it. So you get plus x. But what is a and b? Good. It's a quarter times x. So you're going to minus a quarter times x. Do you see what we just did there? We said that this is the probability of a times the probability of b. So then we get 2 thirds minus 1 quarter. There's so much muttering and murmuring today. I'm getting really annoyed. So you've got a simple equation that you're just going to solve here. So you've got 2 thirds minus a quarter. So 5 twelfths equals 3 quarters x. So you get that x is equal to 5 over 9. So the probability of b is 5 over 9. Now, this is where I'm not sure what you will prefer to do as your strategy. There's two kind of approaches to this rest of the question. What do you think the two approaches might be that I'm about to suggest? Venn diagram is going to be one of the potential ways of thinking about this. And the other way is just using the formulae. Okay? I personally, I like Venn diagrams a lot. I feel quite secure once I've drawn a Venn diagram. I feel like the question just becomes really simplified. But if you wanted to, the probability of not A and B, presumably those are also going to be independent events, aren't they? If A and B are independent, then not A and B are also going to be independent from each other. So I'm going to do it both ways. I'm going to start off doing it the... Pardon? Well, if they're nothing to do with each other, then the, the complements, the nots, are also going to be nothing to do with each other. Like rolling a duck, if it was like... Rolling a, a six on a dice and flipping a coin and getting tails is going to be this. They're going to be as independent as uh, not rolling a six on a dice and getting tails on oh, a dice. Yeah. So for part B, I'm going to do a Venn diagram to start with, and then we're going to see that it's the same as doing it the other way. So you can pick which one you prefer. So A and well, A is a quarter, and B is five ninths. So the probability of A and B is a quarter times 5 ninths, which is 5 over 36, right? Yeah. So 
So you get 5 over 36 in here. Then we'll do a quarter minus that. So you get a ninth over here. And you do 5 ninths minus this. And you get 5 twelfths over here. which means the outside is a third. So if it's not in A and it is in B, which is the part that we're looking at? 5 over 12. So let's just see that we get that the answer of the probability of not A and B is 5 over 12. But remember, we could have said that the probability of not A and B is the probability of not A times by the probability of B not A is 3 quarters, and B is 5 ninths, which is 5 twelfths. So if you like Venn diagrams, that might be something that you can do. But these also, you can use the independence law for the not parts of it as well. Yeah? Am I wrong in doing the, prob the probability of not A and B take away? No, the probability of not A take away the probability of not A and B. Yeah. And that will give me five twelfths. Yep. Yeah. And then last of all, we're going to do the probability of not B, given that it's in A. Now, there's two approaches to this. There's either doing the Venn diagram, or there's the a formulae. I'm on a, I like Venn diagrams, like I've, I've repeated about five times this lesson. Um, so the probability that it's not B, given that it's in A, I do what we... Do you remember what I called this? The idea where I shade in some of it last lesson. Good, the restricted sample space. So I'm saying given that it's in A, what is the probability that it's not in B? So it looks like for the probability of not B, given that it's in A, well, it's out of the A probability, which is a quarter, and the probability that it's not B is a ninth, so it's a ninth out of a quarter which is a 36th. Is that right? No, that's not right. It's 4 ninths. A ninth divided by a quarter is 4 ninths. Yeah. So that's doing it as a restricted sample space. The other way that you could have done this is using the formula. Not B given A is not B and A divided by the probability of A. Well, not B and A is this, which is a ninth, and A is a quarter. So although it ends up with exactly the same maths, your brain is doing different things. This one, your brain is sort of like just looking at a Venn diagram and sh shrinking it down. This one, you're looking at a Venn diagram and just selecting the pieces that you need for the formula. They, they are the same, but there's, I think there's a different thing that goes through my brain when I think of a restricted sample space and when I think of a, um, a formula use. Hamza? That's part D. That's part C. That's part D. That's part B. And that's and that's part C. I've not been uh, very on it today. I mean, Hamza. A and B are independent, so the probability of not B given A is the probability of not B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hamza's done it again. They're independent. Oh. Of course, not B given A, because they're independent, it's just the probability of not B. And the probability of not B, if B is 5 ninths, is just 4 ninths. Well, at least we've tested that all the laws work. Okay, and Sadia, look, they gave the same answer, which is great. Everything works, okay? So, yeah, I did do that deliberately. I did it twice. I made a mistake twice. Just to see if Hamza would pick up on it. And uh, you know what? Only Hamza was the one that picked up on it. So obviously no one was listening to Hamza the first time, including me, because I didn't learn from the mistake either. So well done, Hamza. Okay? So you're going to do this question that you've got here, and then we're going to do exercise 2D. We're going to do the whole exercise. And then next lesson, we shall do tree diagrams and exam practice. We're going to do some quite nasty exam stuff. Okay? Thursday session two. Okay, off you go.